Um, Kathy Bigler, come on up here. Uh, the Lord placed a word on Kathy's heart this summer, and she has been obedient to share that with our leadership, and we just know that it is going to be relatable and something that you all can really identify with. So, Kathy, Thank you. take it up. Thank you. Y'all pray with me. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for this day and for letting me see you and the everyday little things in my life. But sometimes those little things feel really big. Um, thank you for being faithful, even when I'm not. And please, Lord, just right now, call my heart and help me to speak clearly the words you've given me. And um, in your son's precious name, I pray. Amen. <sighs> Sorry. I'm a little nervous. Um, what do you think of when you think of summer? Lazy days and fun vacations, maybe? Well, my summer was anything but. Why, you might ask? Well, the culprit is this guy. <laughs> That's a picture from the breeder when we first fell in love with him. Cute, huh? Well, don't be fooled. <laughs> this little stinker is our new Australian shepherd puppy. His name is Jesse, and he is seven months old. He has been the biggest challenge of my life, and that's really saying something because I have five kids. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of my kids, over the years when I would be upset with them about something, God would point out to me that I was actually guilty of the same thing, but in a different way. These last few months, I've realized the same thing was happening with Jesse. Even though the things he was doing was very normal puppy behavior, he was still being disobedient. God started showing me that even though he loves me and I am his child, I was also being disobedient. God calls me his. I am a child of God, and it's so important to recognize his voice when he calls me. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. If I get distracted in my life or with the things of this world and don't come when God calls me to him, I could miss out on him using me for his purposes or I could miss out on a blessing that he has planned for me. The next command that Jesse learned was sit. The purpose of learning to sit was to get his full attention for him to wait and get ready for further learning. God also wants our full attention. He wants us to sit at his feet he wants us to come to him in prayer. He wants to teach us and grow us in relationship with him. Sitting at the feet of Jesus in the Bible is what the disciples did. God wants the same of us. One thing I did and still sometimes do with Jesse was keep him tethered to me on a leash. In this mode, we went everywhere together. This was to grow our relationship and create a strong bond. I am so sorry. I totally missed a whole page. <laughs> I'm just gonna go with it. Okay, create a strong bond between us. It's so much easier to be obedient to someone you love. This is also true of our relationship with God. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Jesse was by my side, leaning into me all day long. God wants the same from us. The leash can be used to make a quick and easy correction. When you are so close to God and leaning into him, it's so much easier to turn away from temptation. The next command was down. This was important for him to learn so that he can relax in a hectic situation. Rest is also important in our spiritual walk with the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The next command was stay. This was an easy command for him at first, but eventually he wants to get up and go about his business. It really made me think about how many times in my life that I started walking so close with God and staying right by his side only to eventually start doing my own thing. John 15, four says, abide in me and I in you. As in the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Place was the next command. It involves a blanket that is his, and he will run to it and sit on it until he is released. We basically use place as a mental reset. For example, if Jesse is getting too rough with our other dog, Teddy, we will tell him to go to his place so that things do not escalate any further. Church, and even CBS, is a place for reset. 
Part of Hebrews chapter 10 talks about a new way to live. In verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right now, it feels like the day is drawing near. So we too need to go to our place. We need to find our way back to our fellow Christians to help us when things get hard. Look at me is used when there are distractions on our walk. I will say, look at me. So he keeps his focus on me and not on the walkers that are passing us or the squirrel crossing the sidewalk. God wants me to keep my eyes on him and not on the distractions in this world. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Leave it and drop it are commands that can be used separately, but sometimes together if Jesse didn't leave it alone first. These are the hardest commands to teach him. Thankfully, I got help from trainers on these two commands. Ironically, these are the hardest in my life too. When we are tempted in our life, God will tell us to leave it. Sadly, like Jesse, I can be very stubborn at times and my leave it turns into drop it. This summer, I had a hard time leaving what God was asking of me. I also needed help, but from the Holy Spirit. There was no way I could do it on my own. High five was a fun and easy command that Jesse likes. For us, high fives are typically given after a game win or a good play. Sometimes it's used before a game as a motivator. I feel like all the hearts God kept showing me with Jesse were really just high fives from him telling me that I could do it. I love that he was encouraging me through this challenging time. One of my favorite verses is, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. This summer, we learned that Jesse is a normal puppy. With a little bit of maturing, he will get better about his hurting and give Teddy his space. Jesse is the shepherd that Teddy never asked for and definitely doesn't want. <laughs> he kind of looks like a sheep over there. <laughs> Our great news is that we also have a shepherd and one that we definitely want and need. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The last command I have time to talk about today is take a bow. We are still working on this with Jesse. At the end of a performance, a performer will take a bow while receiving praise for a job well done. One day, when our time here on earth is over, we will bow at the feet of Jesus in heaven, but it will not be about us. All glory and praise will be given to him. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under earth. In case you're wondering, I finally surrendered and did my fast. Jesse, like me, is mostly obedient. He is going to be an amazing dog one day, but it's going to take time. I've, I've been a Christian for 43 years, and I am far, far from perfect. Sanctification is definitely a process. One thing Jesse loves more than anything is treats. They are his reward for obeying my commands. Sometimes there are rewards or blessings for us when we obey God. It is my prayer, and I'm sure it is yours too, that one day we, we will receive the best reward of all, hearing our Lord and Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I skipped that whole page, but there's a heart in this sidewalk that God kept showing me to just tell me that I could get, go, get through it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. What a great way to start the morning, ladies. You are dismissed to your core groups. Have a great discussion time. Well, as you can tell, I've got on my Astros orange today. It is that time of year again. <laughs> Playoff time is here, and hopefully today won't be as um, much of a nail biter as Tuesday was. Hopefully we'll get this put away early so we can all breathe um, and not wait for that ninth inning but wow, is that powerful, Jordan. Oh, that was good. That was good. So go Stros. Um, our kids are having a great lesson today, and half of them have Astros gears on, gear on, so it's, it's fun back there. They're all dressed in their Astros stuff. But um, they have a wonderful lesson about Isaac and Isaac. Oh, look, there's some Stros right there. Um, Isaac uh, receiving abundant blessings from the Lord. Um, he received a blessing of a wife and kids, and when there was a famine, God provided so much food for him. And so the aim is to teach the children that all of their blessings come from God, just as he blessed Isaac. So we thank Joan Singer and her core group for holding babies back there today. There's a baby for everybody. So um, it's, we got a full house back there today, and so it's a great day. Speaking of kids... 
Tom and I had the joy of going to visit our grandson this past weekend. I think we have a picture. Oh, look at Sam. He, he won't smile very well. He just, he, he's like his Uncle Jack, my son. Um, anyway, but um, it was such a fun time. My daughter Taylor, her husband Nick and Sam, they moved from Florida this summer to a little town in southwestern Georgia. And it has been a great move for all of them, for my son-in-law's job. It's a great move. Um, Taylor's loving it. It's a great little town. Sam loves it. We love going to visit. But you know, if you're a grandma, you know when you go visit, it's not about your children. It's about the grandchildren, right? You go for the grandchildren, right? And that's why we went. And when we're there, it's all about Sam. Whatever Sam wants to do, we do. Um, I'm Lolly, or as Sam says, he can't say his L's real well. He, I'm Wawi. So Wawi and Grandpa, whatever he, want, he wants to do, we are doing it. If you want to play hide-and-seek for two hours? Okay, we'll play hide-and-seek. You want to do board games? We do board games. You want to go to the pumpkin patch? We go to the pumpkin patch. The pumpkin patch was so much fun. We went and... Of course, he runs around and has to touch every pumpkin there. He wants to try and pick up every pumpkin there. We wandered through a corn maze. There was a bouncy house, a petting zoo, and food. There was food everywhere. And food plays a big part of the story that I'm going to tell you here this morning. Because when we got to Georgia, when we hit the ground, I started eating. I don't know what it was. My daughter is an amazing cook, and so she always has great food in her house. And she has all kinds of treats always on the counter, cookies and chips. And there's always an opportunity to eat. And when I'm at her house, I don't know what it is. I lose all willpower. I just eat and eat and eat. It, I mean, it's, it's ugly. And so he wanted to go to the pumpkin patch. And so on Saturday, but, you know, there was something going on Saturday morning. And so after the Longhorns soundly defeated the Oklahoma Sooners, we, we went to the pumpkin patch. But we had eaten all kinds of football food all day. And so by the time we get to the pumpkin patch on Saturday afternoon, I am feeling so bloated and gross. And I think on the airplane, someone went into my suitcase, took out my jeans, and put in two sizes too small of jeans because... Y'all, it just, what? oh, it was uncomfortable. It, you, you know, whatever weight you are, when you're a few pounds over that weight, you just don't feel good about yourself, right? And so it, it was just one of those weekends. But remember, whatever Sam wants, Sam gets. So as we walk through the front gate, he sees pictures of ice cream cones. And it's homemade ice cream, y'all. And their specialty is Georgia peaches ice cream. You had to. Well, I had to. I had to. And so after eating the ice cream cone, oh, my gosh, y'all, it hurt. It hurt. I, my, they, my jeans were so tight. Like if that button would have flown off, it would have put someone's eye out. I, it, was, it was bad. So I'm feeling gross. My belly is all distended. And Sam sees in the distance this train. We have a picture. It's not really a train. It's a tractor pulled by those oil carts. You know, you've, you've been there, right? And so he says, Wowie, let's go. What are you going to do? So he and I, we have the next picture, like grease pigs, I shimmy down <laughs> into this thing with him. We were stuffed in there. It was so tight. It was so uncomfortable. But he was having a blast. So we did it. And so you're thinking, what does this have to do with me feeling gross and fat, right? Well, about halfway through the ride, our little cart starts wobbling and shaking. <laughs> and then we hear a really loud pop. And Sam, Wowie, what's that? We blew the tire. <laughs> oh, y'all. I'm telling you. And it was right, at, my husband has a video, he, it, it, and you could see the, and it just riding, riding on the rim now. And oh my goodness, Taylor and Nick and Tom, they are laughing hysterically at me. And it was a very humbling experience, needless to say. It was humbling. 
thankfully, this humbling experience did not have serious consequences. It's just a silly story. But as we open the text today, we see that a story of a king who lost his kingdom and lost his life because he refused to humble to the Lord God Almighty. So the question as we go through our lesson today, is there an area in your life where you need to allow the Lord God to work on you? Pride, arrogance, self-importance, something like that. Remember, it's a lot easier for us to humble ourselves than to have God come and have to humble us, right? James says in James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that you do place a high priority on humility and the importance of being humble. Father, let all of us get all of that pride and ego out of the way and surrender that to your throne and allow you to lead us and guide us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week, Tracy did a great job teaching how Nebuchadnezzar was hung, humbled. Um, she called him Neb, so we'll keep calling him Neb this week. After he's out there in the field eating like a cow, the grass, for seven years, right? And finally, he lifts his eyes up to heaven, and he declares, we have from last week's lesson, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that he was walking in pride. But the great thing about Nebuchadnezzar is he recognized that the Lord God Almighty was patiently walking alongside him. And he recognized that that same God justly humbled him. But then he also saw that that same God graciously restored him, right? So we saw Nebuchadnezzar last week, and as we flip the page to chapter 5, we see there's a new king on the throne, Belshazzar. Belshazzar, or I'll call him Bel, since she called him Neb, I'll call this guy Bel. Bel is Neb's grandson. And it's very clear that the grandson has not learned the hard-earned lessons of his grandfather, right? So we're going to talk a little bit history here for, for contextual purposes because um, it'll put the rest of the narrative into focus if, if we know a little bit of the history behind where we open the chapter. So it's been 30 years between the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. 30 years has gone by, and there have been a succession of kings that have come and gone. After Nab dies, these kings come up, they've got all this greed and ambition, and they are ruthless about attaining the crown. I found a chart that would help us. Um, we have a chart here, and so, oh, that looks so much better than I had it. Thank you, Rochelle. <laughs> I sent her this little homemade thing, and she just made it good. Um, okay, so these dates here, these are not their dates of birth and death. These are their dates of when they ruled. Okay, oh, so people are taking pictures, so go, go. Okay, so we're going to start with Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar's father first ruled Babylon. Then there's Nebuchadnezzar. Now, when he dies, look at this, his son's name. Is that just not telling? His name is Evil Merodach. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And so his son, Nebuchadnezzar's son, takes over. And evil Merodach, he only rules for two years before his brother-in-law, I don't know how to say this, I'm going to call him Ner. Okay, so when Ner kills him and takes the throne. Okay, and so this is the son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar. So he's now king, Ner. Ner rules for six years as king. He dies and his son, who is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, his son, Marduk, I guess, um, he is in office, uh, y'all get this, two months, I'm trying not to fall off the stage, two months when Nabonidus, another son-in-law of the king, murders the nephew and takes the crown. Lovely family. Um, and so Nabonidus is king 
as we um, open the chapter, open chapter 5, okay, Nabonidus is king. And, but he spends most of his time as king out in the outer reaches of the empire, out fighting battles and secure, making treaties and securing more land. And so he decides, I'm going to get my son, Belshazzar, Belshazzar, Bel, whatever his name is, um, who is the grandson of the king, I'm going to have him be co-ruler, co-regent, co-king, and he'll be in charge of Babylon, the city. So the king daddy, <laughs> I'm going to call this guy king daddy, um, he's out in the outskirts, and then Belshazzar is in charge of the city, okay? So... That's what's been going on for 30 years, okay? That's some family drama, right? That's, that's high drama. So a little more history to put it, this in total context here. Historical documentation tells us that on the night that Bell throws this party that we're about to read about, his father, King Daddy Nabonidus, he is out he has heard that the Persians and the Medes are advancing from the north because that's where their territory was. And they're coming south to come and try and conquer um, Babylon. And so he takes forces and he goes north and they ensue in a battle north of Babylon. And Bel, or N Nabonidus, sorry, is captured and taken captive and probably killed, Okay. And the, the Babylonian troops are destroyed. And so this leaves a wide open straight shot for the Persians and the Medes to come down into Babylon. And that's exactly what they do. And as we open this chapter, the Medes and the Persians have surrounded the city of Babylon. Okay? Now, m most scho many scholars believe that Belshazzar is absolutely aware that the enemy is outside the city gates. Why is he indifferent to the danger? That's just how arrogant this man is. That's how confident he is that his city of Babylon is impenetrable. But history would confirm that. For a thousand years, no enemy has been able to get into the city of Babylon. They have built these huge system of walls and structures all around the city. Some some. Um, writers said like 300 feet tall. They have these big turrets on the top where they could look out and see anyone's coming. They had this huge impassable moat that surrounded the city. And that moat, this is very important, is fed by the Euphrates River that comes from the north. Okay? Hold that thought. So this moat surrounds the city. So no one is able to get in. The enemy can't get in and has never been able to get in. And on top of that, um, Bell has, scholars say, up to 20 years, I don't know how this happens, 20 years worth of food stored up in the city. And they've got the fresh water from the river. So Bell thinks, I'll just wait them out. I'll outlast them, right? We'll just close up the gates and we'll sit in here and we'll outlast them. It's kind of like, did you ever see the movie Titanic? There's a employee on the Titanic that famously in the movie he says not even God could sink, sink this ship right that's kind of arrogance and I think that's what Bell is thinking not, not, not even God could take this city from me in his arrogance Bell came up with perfect way to show how confident of victory he was he says let's throw a party right so he has a party and that's where we'll pick up with the festivities already in progress the wine is flowing, and scholars say that um, Bell is feeling no pain, as they say. Feeling no pain. And by all accounts, this was not a, a party like you and I would go to. This is a disgusting, drunken orgy, is what this is. Um, the king is feeling emboldened and invincible, and I think he's thinking, I'm the greatest king of all times. I'm greater than Cyrus the Persian although he, he's about to be toppled by Cyrus. Um, I'm greater than my grandfather, and I think he's thinking I'm greater than God himself. That's just how arrogant this man is. And so in his drunken bravado, he orders that the sacred vessels that had been taken from the temple in Jerusalem years ago, they'd been taken and they'd been in, held in storage in Babylon. He says, bring those in here so we can drink out of them. 
And so both the men and the women of the feast brazenly drink out of these consecrated vessels. So this is like the chalices and the pitchers that they would use in worship of Jehovah God back in the temple. And here, Bell and his friends are treating this like red solo cups at a frat party. Right? I mean, they are committing acts of blasphemy that no other Babylonian king dared to ever do. This was sacrilege, it was desecration, and it was gross irreverence for the Lord God Almighty. Bell demonstrated his pride by desecrating the holy vessels and treating God with utter contempt. Not only did Bell and his friends drink out of these vessels, they are toasting and using these vessels in worship of their little g false gods, the god of wood and iron and gold and all this kind of stuff. Ladies, this wasn't carelessness. This wasn't a drunken mistake or just a stupid thing. In doing this, he is blatantly showing contempt not only for his grandfather, but for the Lord God Almighty. Bell will soon find out that people can defy God's will. They can... Um, blaspheme his name, but not for long, because the hand of the Lord will soon begin to move. And that's exactly what happens next. Verse 5. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. That would sober you up, wouldn't it? <laughs> right? It would be eerie, to say the very least, to see that hand writing on the wall. And notice this little detail that, that Daniel gives us, kind of almost in passing. He says, uh, opposite the lampstand. The lampstand would have probably been a la very large chandelier that would have illuminated the entire room and shined a, sh shone a light onto that wall where the hand is. And so it's like this giant PowerPoint presentation for everyone at the party to see, Right? Everyone is seeing this. And the handwriting was now on the wall. And yes, this is where that saying comes from, the handwriting on the wall. Um, it usually refers to a dramatic negative event that's going to happen really quickly. You hear people, they break up a relationship and they say, well, it was inevitable. I saw the handwriting on the wall a few weeks ago, right? That's exactly where this comes from. This is biblical. So he sees the handwriting, and this causes physical um, distress for the king. This self-confident, arrogant king, I mean, it, he is terrified by what he sees. And he, some scholars think he's passed out, fallen. He's just like out of his mind with fear and, and trepidation. How humiliating this must have been for the king, for him to, like, lose himself in front of all of his important guests. Quite simply, God has turned this banquet room into a courtroom, and the king is about to be found guilty. Bell summons the magicians. How foolish is this? Um, if he, only he had learned from his grandpa's mistakes, he wouldn't have wasted the time of the magicians or himself. The magicians come in, and of course, they're baffled, which once again, God is showing us the futility of human wisdom when trying to decipher God's will. And even if they could read what was on the wall, they didn't have the answer key. They couldn't decipher what the, the message meant. Only God had that. So the magicians scratch their head, hmm, no, no, no. and this causes even more panic for the king. This is when the queen comes in. The queen is not the king's wife. Probably the, queen, the king's grandmother, Neb's uh, widow, probably, is what they think. And she says, hmm, I have an idea. Let's ask Daniel. He's the smartest guy in the country. Let's ask him. Hmm, let's talk to him. He helped your grandpa. Maybe he could help you. It seems incredible to me that Belle would have never bothered to consult with Daniel. Daniel was high up in the government. He is the wisest counselor in all of the empire. Yet he has never 
bothered to get to know Daniel or to consult with him. And that made me wonder, how long has it been since Daniel has been even standing before a king? Over these past 30 years, have any of these kings invited him in for consultation or help me, tell me, guide me, give me instruction? We don't know. By now, Daniel's 80 years old. He's 80 years old. He lived his entire life over here in exile. Perhaps by now he's in royal retirement. But even in retirement, he is available when God calls. And God calls him into this situation to decipher what this message is. Isn't it funny? Here's Daniel. He's done so much in his lifetime to benefit the Babylonian empire. And yet when he comes before the king, the king is so rude to him. The king says, oh, oh, you're that, Daniel. You're one of those exiles. Such disdain and disrespect for this man of God. Yet Daniel is courteous and polite because, you know, this isn't Daniel's first rodeo. (laughs) He's been here with these kings before. These kings, you know, the scenario is very familiar. There's a revelation from God. The king gets scared and frustrated. He calls in the magicians. They can't interpret it. So finally, he calls in God's servant to the rescue. So Daniel's there, but before he reveals what the message says, he wants to give the king a little history lesson. So let's, let's hear the history lesson. He says, O king, the highest God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your grandfather, the kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, All people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. And we know from last week's lesson that because of his pride, God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And then Daniel continues, verse 22. And you, his son, Belshazzar, has not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. And that just really stood out to me, that, and you knew all of this. Bell knew the story of his grandfather. He knew how God had come into his grandpa's life and turned things around and humbled him and restored him, and yet he chose to disregard the truth. Choices. You know, I talked about Sam earlier. Taylor and Nick work with Sam a lot on making good choices. He's three and a half, and so we're working on choices. There's green choices, which are good, red choices, which are bad choices. And so when he goes to school, Mother's Day out, he he comes home and she, you know, talks to him in the car, did you make red choices or green choices today? And he is honest to a fault. You know, he'll just sit there and confess, I made a red choice because I hit Jacob. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and so, but it's choices, right? It makes me wonder how many of us hear the truth of the gospel and we make the choice to disregard it. How many of us sit in church week after week after week and we hear the truth taught, but we choose to disregard it in our lives? Those are red choices, y'all. Those are red choices. Is there something that you know is true, but you're choosing to disregard it today? I would encourage you to pray about that and just lay that at the feet of the Lord. Because sometimes that's a pride thing that we're choosing not to, but, well, I'm going to stand my ground. That's a pride thing. And this is what we're talking about today, surrendering that to the Lord. Daniel says you knew the truth, but you chose to disregard it. Daniel is saying, Bill, you got a problem with pride and arrogance, and idolatry, and desecration. And he's, did you love when Daniel says, you didn't honor the God who holds in his hand your life and your ways. You didn't honor him. And then Daniel reads, so the entire room can hear what's written on that wall. Like a jury foreman announcing a verdict, he says, mene, mene, tekel, parson. Unlike the magicians, Daniel knew what this meant because God had given him the interpretation. Mene meant that God has determined and established the end of the Babylonian kingdom. The reason it's repeated 
is because that means it's coming really quickly, <laughs> like in a matter of hours, the Babylonian kingdom will fall. Tekel indicated that God himself has, God has, God has weighed the king and found him guilty. And then Parson, your version may have said Perez, it's just, uh, it's a plural versus singular difference. But that means it will be divided. And divided between the Persian and the, the, Mede, um, the Medes and the Persians will divide the kingdom. Bell listens to the interpretation. But amazingly, he didn't seem too phased by it. He doesn't seem too moved because he, he goes ahead and he says, okay, well, Daniel, you did that. So here, let me give you a prize. And he said, come up here. We'll have the purple robe and bring, up, bring in the gold chain and we'll do that. And you'll, you're now third ruler of the kingdom. Did you, why, you wonder why third? Well, remember the chart? Nabonidus, King Daddy, is number one, but he's dead or prisoner. There we go. Belshazzar is number two, but he's about to be dead. And so that leaves Daniel, third ruler of all the kingdom, right? But the kingdom isn't going to be around much longer, so what good is that? Obviously, Bell doesn't realize the party's over. It's kind of like the smoke alarm's going off. You can smell the smoke. You can see the fire. But let's keep the party going. It's crazy. It's crazy. Unbeknownst to the king... North of the city, where the Euphrates River is flowing down into town, the Persian army has diverted the river so that the river will not flow down into town anymore. And so as they're partying, the moat is going down. The water is going down in the moat. And history tells us that that very night, the Medes and the Persians who were, have been outside the city while they partied inside, the Medes and the Persians quietly waded through the moat, under the bridges, over the walls, and came in absolutely untouched and conquered Babylon. Killed the king. October 539 B.C., Babylon as an empire ceased to exist. And now the Medes and the Persians are in charge. This takes us back to that statue from Daniel chapter 3. Do we have that? Remember that? Remember that? Exactly as God had ordained. The head of gold was conquered by the silver arms and chests of the Medes and Persians. Don't y'all love the Bible? It is so cool. <laughs> it is so cool. Like King Bell, there's a lot of people in our world today who disregard the lessons of the past. And instead choose to make those red choices. <laughs> What's the old saying? Those who don't remember the past are condemned to relive it, right? That's the importance, ladies, of what you do here on Thursday or Tuesday for our remotes. It's the importance of studying. This is our history. This is our past. It's so vitally important that we know what this book says so we don't repeat the mistakes that they made. Bell disregarded the hard lesson that his grandpa had to learn, the lesson of pride and arrogance, the lesson that God is able to humble the proud. Ladies, do you really want God to have to come and humble you? I don't think so. Isn't it better that we humble ourselves before his throne? Let's close this morning by looking at what Jesus had to say about humility. You know, Jesus is our first and foremost example of how to live a humble life. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 18 about a tax collector and a Pharisee who go to the temple to pray. Let's look at that first slide. This is Jesus speaking. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes at all, of all that I get. So notice in that prayer, <laughs> he, this isn't a prayer to God. It's not about God. It's about himself. It's about me and how good I am and how bad everybody else is. And this is the picture of pride and arrogance, right? Jesus contrasts that. He continues speaking, and he says, but the tax collector 
standing far off, would not lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So this tax collector, who is dis his profession is despised by most everybody in the public, but he is painfully aware of his own sins and his own unworthiness before God. He can't even lift his eyes up and look at God. He stands in the back of the temple. He's, he, he doesn't even want to go near the, the altar because he's so ashamed of, of his sin. His focus is on his sin and his need for mercy. And Jesus ends that passage by saying, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus places a very high priority on humility, and so should we. Is there an area in your life that you need to allow God to work on, some area of pride or arrogance or self-importance? Let's remember what James tells us. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures today. I pray that we will be women who come and humble ourselves at the feet of the cross, trusting in you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.